Happy Wednesday and happy Thanksgiving Eve. Thank you for making Locked on Red Sox your first listen of every single day. I'm your host, in essence, Lauren Willand, and today's episode, Jake and I are so excited to bring you because we will be joined very shortly by the Athletics' Chad Jennings. Chad covers the Red Sox for The Athletic and has for a while now. We talk everything Red Sox, Xander Bogarts, of course, Ryan Brazier, kind of the outlook for the Red Sox, the closer situation in the outfield, who he thinks fits on this roster as opposed to maybe who doesn't fit and everything in between. We're so excited for this episode. Let's just jump right into it. You are locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are here with Red Sox beat reporter from The Athletic, Chad Jennings. So how are we doing, Chad? How's your offseason been going so far? My offseason's been all right. I, uh, I just got home from a Disney cruise, so I've spent uh, the past five days with small children and oversized mice, uh, but it was fun, and it was warm, and now it's cold, and I have to host Thanksgiving in two days. So uh, yeah, man, lots going on. That's a slap, be, like a slap of reality. Yeah, this would be an awesome day for the Red Sox to do like a big signing and just <laughs> throw everything else into chaos. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be even worse, you know, if, if they literally did it on Thanksgiving in the middle of dinner. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. right. I'll be right During back. the Patriots oh game. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. By the way, has, yeah. has there ever been an instance that ha- that has happened uh, where it's the most inconvenient time? I, you know, I, I, the one for me that's that was inconvenient for myself was when I was still in New York covering the Yankees, and it was when they like the they lost Cano. Cano signed with the Mariners, and I think was it the and I think it was that day that they signed Ellsbury and oh Carlos God. Beltran. I think that's right. <laughs> That's sort of how I remember it. Is that it all, or maybe it was just that they lost Cano, and then that night signed. Sarn- I just know that that night I had all these plans. I had so many things I was supposed to. I was out in the city with a friend of mine who was in town, and like I mean, I'm literally like walking out of the bar to write a story on my phone from oh my the God. streets of Manhattan to like <laughs> say, yeah, I, yeah. It was that was the one that was maybe the most inconvenient for me, but uh, I don't. Th- think that my random night out in New York qualifies as like the same thing as signing a player on Thanksgiving. <laughs> it should, honestly. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, that yeah, would be kind of crazy. Just... That would be kind of crazy on like Christmas Day. Xander uh, resigns right. Devers extension out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, totally. you know, the kids open up the yeah. presents. Hold up. This is the biggest story of the entire office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, I, I remember – so I think Teixeira might have signed like a couple of days before Christmas. Yeah. That's but, right. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't remember. I mean, I can't remember one like fully on a holiday. But yeah, I mean, the, the poor NFL I'll... writers, every once in a while, it's like an actual game on Thanksgiving yeah. they have to go to. One, one thing I'll cover, never like, forget with Teixeira, it was reported on January 18th, which is my birthday, that he could potentially sign with the Red Sox. And then, yeah, I saw the Yankees thing. And I'm like, all right. Great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was like eight years. I was like, you know, nine years old back then. So I really took it to heart. <laughs> but so, I mean, you know, we, we, we spoke about Xander a little bit. If, if you did see, you know, Bogart's not re-signing with the Red mm-hmm. Sox this offseason, where, where do you think, you know, he might end up, you know, like a Philadelphia or, you know, Chicago or something like that? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I keep thinking like all the places you see him linked to are the ones that make sense, right? It's, I mean, it's teams that are, that think they're going to be in contention relatively soon. Like, you know, the, the, the Cubs make sense. Obviously, there are all the connections there to the Red Sox. And so obviously they know him. And that sort of thing worked in the past, right? Like they were kind of out of it when they signed John Lester and they used that as kind of a springboard to suddenly become, you know, they knew they were going to be relevant sometime during that contract. And that was kind of a shift for them. Um, so I could see Xander working there, but for all the reasons you could see him working somewhere else, he fits here, right? I mean, the, he, that's Xander fits here. Xander fits the Red Sox better than he fits anywhere else because they have they line up in all the same ways all the other teams 
makes sense, right? They expect to be contenders pretty soon. They have a farm system that has potential shortstops coming up where if Xander has to move off the position in a couple of years, they should be fine. And the added bonus is it's Xander Bogarts and they are the Red Sox, right? Like it, it, it makes so much sense. And my understanding based on public comments, based on private conversations, all of that is that they're not blowing smoke when they say they, that that is their number one priority. I think their off season is built around the idea of getting Xander back, putting him at shortstop. I think they still want to sign Devers to an extension as well, but that, you know, they can, you don't want to, but you can kick the can down the road on that one, right? Like you can just do the arb year and, 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 you know, live to fight another day on signing him long-term. So I think Xander, I do think they're trying to sign Xander. I think they're built around the idea of getting Xander there, you know, fill out some of the rotation, get a big bat to replace JD, but it's all centered on Xander as the focus. Now, whether that means they get something done, I don't know because Heim is who he is. And I think Heim's a smart guy. I think he knows what he's doing, but he is a meticulous guy, right? He is going to, he wants to make all of these things work, get all the pieces in place. And, you know, I mean, could it get out of a, to a price range where he just thinks that it doesn't make any sense now? I, sure. I mean, I think that's possible. Um, I think it would be a real shame for everyone involved if that's where it goes. Uh, Cause I, I, I think it'd be a shame for Xander to end up having to play somewhere else. And it would be a shame for the Red Sox to lose him. So, I mean, right now, I, I think the smart money is on him being back with the Red Sox, but we'll see. Yeah, that's obviously the, one of the biggest storylines the Red Sox are facing this year. And, you know, you said that, that everything that's that's been said uh, publicly, especially, it sounds like they want to make Xander their priority. I they're, mm -hmm. they're saying the right things now, it's just a matter of doing the right things and I think Bogarts is also very important to Devers. I think they have, it's very clear that these guys are yeah. best friends. They know they're, they're yeah. brothers there. And it's, it's great too, that when Raphael Devers, as he continues to learn English, that Bogarts can speak to him in his native language so they can connect that way too. Mm -hmm. So there's a, many connections there and obviously Bogarts being a leader on this team, but it's still pretty early in the off season, but we do have the, the winter meetings approaching. Do you see a deal getting done specifically with Bogarts? I know you said we can, you know, kick the can with Devers mm -hmm. for a little while, but do you see something happening kind of sooner rather than later? Cause I, I can't imagine Bogarts will want to wait till like the end of January, February, but I can also see that, you know, kind of getting into bidding wars here. Yeah, I think so. I think if it's going to happen, it should happen sooner than later. Right. Like, I, I think if it goes too late at some point, everyone's going to have to move on. Like the, the good feelings between the Red Sox and Bogarts, if that's going to be a factor and is going to sort of spur them somewhere. And if this is going to remain the Red Sox priority, they've got to figure out if this is going to happen before they decide, okay, do we need to now commit that much money to somewhere else? Do we need to figure out a whole other direction to go? Maybe that's with a much lesser shortstop, but with a bigger bat in the outfield, there's there, there may be other ways to do this. But I think that the Red Sox in particular are going to have to figure it out sooner rather than later. Maybe Xander can wait. And, and maybe Xander decides that, you know, he and Boris are going to just wait the market out and, and really wait to try to get whatever the biggest deal is they can get. But if that's the case, I don't think that bodes well for the Red Sox because they have too many holes to fill. They, they have too many things they have to do here. And if, they're go if this offseason is going to be built around Xander, uh, you need to get that done. Um, so that you know exactly what the what kind of other pieces you need to fill in. And as you mentioned, the, the team has just so many holes to fill throughout this offseason to really get back to, you know, World Series contention in 2023. And, you know, one of the biggest clearing needs is in the rotation. And uh, mm -hmm. we've heard Corey Kluber, Andrew Heaney, multiple other names. We know that the Red Sox under High Bloom have essentially been the interest kings. But right. what guys – on the, the free agent market or the trade market, could you really feel confident in saying are going to put on a Red Sox uniform in 2023? Well, I mean, that's, it's hard to say like, Oh, confident that they'll put it on. I honestly, I thought when they, when they made the qualifying offer to, to Evaldi, I thought there was a chance that would work. I, I thought there was a chance he'd take the qualifying offer. I thought there was a chance it would spur them to some sort of three year deal, you know, for more than what Anderson got in LA, but, but not for, you know, a boatload more. Um, I thought there was a chance that would work. And if that works, then I think you could have gone to 
a, a Heaney Kluber type, right? You, you you need somebody else to add to that. You don't you wouldn't have enough, but I still think they could try to go bigger, right? The, uh, Senga, the guy in, in Japan, I, th- I think he makes a lot of sense for them, and I know that they've been on him for a long time. Um, they've liked him. Uh, to me, that's the guy to target. Um, I don't – those other guys, you know, you know, Verlander, DeGrom, I mean, they are what they are. Maybe Rodon, but it doesn't seem like that's the way they're going to go. Um, so th- that's sort of where my head is, is. I think they still need a guy who – you could confidently put at the top, whether that's what the, you know, the ACE, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that means it's Verlander or DeGrom, but I think you need somebody who's up there. That's that, that has the potential for real impact. And then another guy too. I mean, the guys they have now, it's, it's not terrible, right? It's not the worst thing I've ever seen in the world. I mean, there are, there is a world in which, you know, one of Chris sale or James Paxton is pretty good at least one of Garrett Whitlock and Brian Bayo is pretty good, right? Like you can see they've got enough of these pieces where it's like, okay, I see how that could work. And, and Pavetta there is kind of like the guy who's reliably given you 190 innings and is going to make 33 starts. Um, it's not the worst, but it, they still need strength there. And I don't think though they have to go sort of uh, – I don't think they need to go into this with a list of like 10 number four or five starters – and let's see which one falls into our into our comfort zone, which is how I think they've approached the past two or three off seasons. I think this year they can more selectively target like, okay, here's where we are. And then that's what I think Gavaldi was, was like, all right, this guy is more stability, right? And then you can build around that. Um, so I, I think they're probably two, add two big league arms in there and, and then they're in pretty good shape. We will get you right back to our conversation with Chad Jennings of The Athletic just as soon as I tell you about Simply Safe. Because if you've thought about securing your home with home security, but for whatever reason you've been putting it off, you will want to listen up because right now, Locked On Red Sox listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year, and you will not want to miss it. Did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like package thefts spike nationally? That's why our friends at Simply Safe Home Security are offering 50% off their award winning security system so that more families can feel safe and secure this holiday season. You can order your Simply Safe system for half off today and enjoy advanced security and greater peace of mind this holiday season. I love Simply Safe. I recently got it for my home. And yes, I do have a Dutch Shepherd. Roxy is great security, but knowing just I have that extra layer of protection just kind of gives me that peace of mind. Whether I'm home, whether I'm out doing some errands, I can always just check in on the cameras. Honestly, sometimes I just check in to see what my dog is up to. You can never be too safe, and that's why Simply Safe has your back. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe. This captures critical evidence and verifies that the threat is real, so you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is a whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, HD security cameras for inside and out, and smarter ways to detect motion that alert you when a threat is real and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home with a top rated Simply Safe app. Stay in complete control of your system anytime, anywhere, arm or disarm, unlock for a guest, access your cameras, adjust your system settings. Listen, with the holidays coming, you can just simply check the camera, make sure it's your guest at the door, unlock it right from your phone. We can do everything from our phones now. So just unlock and then you can let your guest in without having to interrupt whatever you're doing, whether you're cooking, whether you're just watching a show or you can't get to the door immediately, you can still let them in. Do not miss your chance to save big on the only security system that I recommend. Get 50% off any new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. This is their biggest discount of the year. So don't wait. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. There is no safe safe like simply safe thank you so much for making locked on red Sox your first listen of the day now for listen number two make sure you check out the locked on sports today podcast from the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports go beyond the scoreboard behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only locked on can provide 
Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube, Apple, Odyssey, wherever you get your podcasts. If they do add those two big league arms and with Whitlock all but, you know, pretty much going to the rotation mm -hmm. at the in 2023, not really sure with where James Paxton stands, but, you know, he's been a starter for his career. Do you see the Red Sox potentially going to a six man rotation or they would you see them just kind of maybe getting a, a bigger uh, arm for the bullpen? Right. Yeah, I I don't think that they would go six man rotation, but I don't think that means that they would only have five people who are starters. If that makes any sense at all, like, yeah. mm -hmm. I, 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 it, it, there is a way Alex core can be pretty creative, right? We've seen him do it where I think he could mix and match guys. And, and we've seen the Rays do it, right? The Rays have messed around with the roles of pitchers where it's a little bit unclear what anyone's going to be month to month, but and I, so I could see the Red Sox doing something like that. I don't expect them to do some sort of true six man rotation, but I don't think that rules out the idea that, you know, just because Garrett Whitlock is a starter in April doesn't mean there might not be, you know, in the month of May, maybe he's in more of like a piggyback type role. I mean, there just are ways I think, I think teams are starting to get a little more creative in things they consider, right. At least like ways you can run a pitching staff and not just run a rotation. And, and I think they could be with some of the guys they have, particularly with guys like Sale, with Paxton, uh, with with Whitlock, who's had so much success in the bullpen and, and hasn't started that much in the big leagues. I, I think there are ways where it would make sense to try some of these sort of different things and, and move some guys around if players are comfortable with it and if they feel confident they can do it in a way that, you know, frankly, doesn't screw anyone up, you know, and, and that's the trick. I mean, that there in theory, there are ways to do this, but also – whatever that was, what was it two years ago? In theory, it made sense to have Matt Barnes just face the toughest guys in the order every time. Like that was, I thought, Oh, that's great. Like somebody's actually doing this and making their most important reliever, not a closer. But, and then once it was actually put into action, you realized, Oh, th this is, he's going to be dead by June. <laughs> um, so that you may run into some of that too. So it's kind of like how they handled Brian Bayo after they saw him kind of struggle in his few starts and they said, oh, mm -hmm. let's use you like maybe in the second or third inning. And they uh -huh. kind of found that he was really valuable out of there. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could. Yeah. I think you could move guys around. I mean, you, you, I just don't know that teams now look at players as only one thing uh, or pitchers. I mean, you know, there are a handful of mm -hmm. guys who are truly just a starter, but I mean, we even saw it in the playoffs like, two years ago that I mean, Nick Pavetta, has only been a starter. He, I mean, he maybe pitched in the bullpen a little bit with the Phillies, but he was clearly a starting pitcher. And then all of a sudden you get in the playoffs and he was like the closer half the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so I do think that the teams have become a little bit more open to this idea of you don't have to be one thing and they can kind of feel it out, especially when it looks like right now, I mean, you could have, you could have eight starting pitchers on the staff, you know, to start the season. And so then, then it's roster management, it's workload management, it's all that stuff. Very true. And, you know, Pavetta's one guy I'm, I'm curious to see how, sort of how they use him. You know, could, could he be traded? You know, I, I feel like at this uh -huh. point, he's somebody where you know what you're going to get from him, you know, year in, year out. Right. You know, what, what what the Red Sox got from the Phillies is, is exactly what you get. And could, could you potentially see him going more towards a bullpen role? Could you potentially see the, the Red Sox trade him this offseason? I, I mean, yeah, I guess you could. The, the one thing about where they are right now, is he is kind of the only guy I think you can – you feel like pretty safe saying he's going to make 32 starts next year. You know, I don't know that as much as other guys have more upside, you know, he at least is that, right? He's that pretty durable guy. He's going to go out there every five days. And so there's value in that, you know, when your other guys are, you know, Sale, who hasn't pitched in three years, Paxton, who hasn't pitched in three years, Garrett Whitlock, who's made nine big league starts, Brian Bale, who has two months in the big leagues. You know, it's just there's a little I think you'd be a little bit nervous about not having a guy like that who at least, you know, can do it night after night. Um, but that said, depending on what else they get and what's available. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, there, there would be logic in trading him if, if if they if they feel like they have enough pitching, you know, if they do sign of all the and they get another sort of reliable starter, then all of a sudden Pavetta could become more expendable. Sure. You know, I mean, I think it's possible, but, but I think they're for right now where they are now, I think there's also just value in that guy who you can reliably send out there for six straight months.
It kind of reminded me of when Rick Porcello was here. Like he was mm -hmm. always going to eat innings. He was going to get yeah. you deep into games. Was it always going to be the best? No, but like Pavetta, you knew he was he was reliable and he was sturdy out there. And you, those those kinds of guys are, I feel like they're kind of hard to find these days. Yeah, for sure. That's in, and yeah, the the way the game has gone, those guys are fewer and far between, I guess. But but it's also different that uh, I think Porcello also was probably going to give you seven, right? Like, or he <laughs> could give you seven. I don't know. Pavetta's maybe he can give you 30, but you might be going somewhere else in the sixth. Right. Um, <laughs> so th there's, th there's something diminished there, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, Pavetta has been fine. I mean, he, he's, he's not lighting the world on fire, but he's, he's given them kind of what they've needed. I mean, they just needed somebody to give them some stability there. And he's done that. And, you, you know, the bullpen is another area as well that has been a glaring issue for the Red Sox for seems like three some odd seasons. And yeah. we, we, we've heard, you know, a lot of different ways that the Red Sox might go. Seth Lugo is one name that has, has come out so far this offseason. But uh, especially with, you know, them hoping to have a dominant bullpen after it being so thin uh, for the last few seasons, where do you think that they'll really go with them? I, I've especially seeing those first three relievers that came off the free agent market that re-signed these extensions. I'm like, Whoa, okay. I don't know that they're going to want to the, the going right now for a sure thing laid in arm, man. I mean, that's a lot. Um, I kind of feel like they're the approach to the bullpen should be through the trade market. I think you could find some guys that way, you know, I think you trade Jaron Duran. I still kind of like Duran. I, I don't, I don't, not, that's not saying I'm down on him or that he, but you know, I just don't know that he lines up that well for them anymore. If, if a team still values Dahlbeck, you know, could you flip Hosmer to like Kansas city, right? Like they could use a first baseman and he'd probably like to go back there. He's going to get to play a lot, you know, as just like a sweetener in a deal to get one of their relievers. I, I think that mm -hmm. they're, I think that that's more the way to approach the bullpen is to try to find trade partners um, to fill it rather than trying to go out and sign, you know, for that much money, a sure thing reliever, because I, I just, I'm not sure to, a sure thing reliever exists. I mean, even look at the bullpens that were in the world series this year. I mean, that Astros bullpen was great, but not one of those guys came to the Astros as a great pitcher, right? Like, I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's just the nature of it, man. Like, relievers are insane like this, how, how, how up and down they are. And so you're kind of going to need some things to hit. You need Tanner Houck to be good. You need John Schreiber to be good again next year. Um, it's, it's, you need Matt Barnes to bounce. I mean, look, they gave Matt Barnes an extension and then all of a sudden he was unusable, right? Like, I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a hard thing to throw a bunch of money at. So I think they'd rather sort of trade potential for potential um, and try to address it that way. Yeah, the bullpen, it, it's just, it's so funny how to see it, how it's kind of evolved or devolved, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah. But we, especially with Matt Barnes, when he kind of got back on track at the end of last year, hopefully that can ca carry into 2023. But another question mark that fans seem to not be able to get over, and I'm still a little confused on this as Ryan Brazier. I think a lot <laughs> yeah. of people thought he was not going to be tendered a contract, and he mm. was, and Time and time again, Alex Cora, High and Bloom, they've expressed confidence in Brazier. And, you know, he's not a 25 year old that's trying to get back on track. Like this, he's 35 and he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's shown, I believe, what he is the last few years. But he, he did pitch well toward the end of the season. But just how, like, what, what does the front office see in Brazier that makes them keep going back to him? Well, the thing that I kept being told, because I had asked about him during the year too. And it was just like the, everything that they study tells them he's better than this, that that, that his fastball slider combination should be better. It has all of those the qualities that they're looking for. And so if you're going to go on the free agent market, you're going to be looking for these sort of markers. And, and Brazier has those. He's not 25 anymore. He's not a standout closer. But I think the other element of this is he's also not a $10 million arm. I mean, even this year of arbitration, he's going to be what, two some odd million? You know, it, I, I just don't – I think for them that's a worthwhile gamble based on the things they're seeing stuff-wise. And, and knowing that – I mean, he has done it before, right? It's not like you – know, he, he doesn't have a huge track record of it, but he's had – and he's even had spurts this year when he was pretty good again. But I think in, it's it's that sense. It's Yes, it, I understand why it feels like a waste. I thought there was a chance they would non-tender him too. 
but it's just I I think for the the way relievers are right now, the amount of money they'd have to pay for someone that uh, two million, two point five million, or whatever for Ryan Brazier, based on the stuff they see, is like that's that's a worthwhile gamble for them. Um, I think that's the way they're looking at it, and you know, two. Two, $2 million is not enough for the Red Sox to say we cannot cut bait here if it doesn't work, right? Like if they get right. to June and and he stinks and they have better options, they can move on from that. It, it's This is not – I don't think their hands are tied here. That's part of this. It's a one-year deal for this much money on a guy whose stuff they think is better than the numbers showed. And for them, I think that's a – they feel like that's a gamble worth taking. It's also not uh, money where they're like, oh, well, we have Frazier, so we couldn't re-sign Xander. Sorry. Totally. Like- <laughs> right. No, it stops them from doing nothing. It it, yeah. it, it stands in the way of nothing. Um, so, I, I yeah, it's, it's it's not quite like when people get, you know, people get all up in arms over like a minor league contract. And you're like, dude, it doesn't, this doesn't matter. This is fine. <laughs> yeah. But but it's not quite that because he's taken a 40-man spot and all that stuff. But I, I just don't think this is – they're paying $2 million for a guy who I think ideally is like the sixth best bolt reliever in their bullpen. And that's fine. You know, I, I mean, it, that's the way I look at it is they like the stuff. They think the stuff's better than the results have shown. And they think that's worth a shot at two, whatever. We are still chatting with Chad Jennings of The Athletic, and we will get right back to it just as soon as I tell you about Bet Online, because BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get all the latest odds and trends for every professional sport and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer. The World Cup is underway and esports. Everything is covered at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at betonline as well. Literally has everything for the betting sports fan. Always the fastest and the easiest way to get your sports betting fix. You can head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. That's betonline where the game starts. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a if- it's a similar thing with, you know, Josh Taylor. Let's see what he has left back in the tank. You know what I mean? Especially with him, you know, getting setbacks from rehab assignment to rehab mm-hmm. assignment all throughout last season. He's back and get back to where it was, you know, in 2021. Or we'll see what we can get from him. Uh, but especially going towards the closer situation as well, you know, it was sort of a closer by committee, it seemed like last year. Tanner Houck seemed to show some flashes of a good future at that position. But what approach do you think that they'll really uh, – put on the closer situation uh, at point play three. Yeah. I, I mean, think, I think maybe similar to last year where you go in with, I mean, it, uh, it, I guess I should step back first and say, I think it depends on who you can get, but right. If they can, if they could package Duran and someone else and maybe one of those upper level starters or something for a pretty good late inning reliever with two years of control, uh, maybe that's your closer. Right. But, Otherwise, I think they could, you know, you could try. You got, I mean, Barnes looked all right at the end. Like you said, Tanner Houck looked good. I don't think it's Schreiber. I don't think they'd go in, even though he looked good this year. I don't think he's the guy. I think they're, he's just kind of is what he is. Um, but, I, I, you know, maybe do you get, I don't know, David Robertson or someone like that, right? Like a veteran guy who's done it before and then figure, here are these three guys one of them becomes the closer and you hope one of them becomes a setup man. And then if one of them flames out, at least we've got the other two spots, right? I, I, I mean, I think there could be something like that. Um, but, but again, I just think it depends on who's there and, you know, between Tanner and Barnes, I don't know. I mean, do you love the idea of either one of them being guaranteed the closer role? No, but they've also each shown enough at various times to think like, it's not crazy to think one of them, could be good enough to at least be an important part of the late innings. And there's a lot, you know, with the, there's a lot of holes on this team that need to be, <laughs> we've, we've discussed yeah. a lot of them and we've seen some trades happen this off season in the AL East as well. Do you think the Red Sox will kind of target anyone in trades? There's been also interest out there for Brian Reynolds, Sean Murphy. So do you think that the Red Sox look more toward the trade market going into the off season than maybe free agents to try to maybe not spend as much money? Um, well, I mean, maybe, I, you know, like 
I actually think a guy like Jose Abreu fits them pretty well. Um, big right-handed bat could step into JD's role as a DH and also gives you some cover at first. You know, I'm not worried about. I don't think I think Cassis is going to be fine, but I think it's not a bad idea to have a guy like that who you know he is your DH and then can gives you coverage there. And if it does turn out that Cassis needs to sit against a couple of lefties, there's an option. So I think they could spin there. The, the one to me that's sort of such a wild card is the outfield. I mean, they need a corner. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't have, I, I feel like I have no feel for where they're going to go with that. Like, hmm. you know, do they take a shot on Mitch Hanniger or someone or like hope that no shifts makes Joey Gallo good again? I, I don't, I don't know, but I don't think like, I don't think they're going to get judge, uh, but then, then the rest, you know, like Brand Nemo doesn't really fit them that well. I, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that's what it, so. The, the market just doesn't line up that well in the corner outfield. So that's where I could see them trying to find some sort of trade partner. Um, but yeah, I don't know that that's the, that to me, that's the one that's a harder fit. I think you could get sort of a bat to be a DH who also plays the field some days in free agency, but I think they might need to, depending on where the market goes, I could see them trying to make a trade to fill that out, that open outfield spot. And, you know, we, we also brought up, uh, Eric Hosmer in this episode, and you know, you, you brought up Jose Abreu, and you know, I I feel like I won't be surprised if they signed Abreu. You could you could see Hosmer out the door, and do you expect you know him, Hosmer being on the team uh, on opening day? No, but I but that's not to say though that I don't that I that I think it's like crazy that he's on the team right now. I mean, it, right. it's like it's to me it's a Brazier situation again. Like it, it's yeah. it's fine. It's not it's not really a problem for now. They it, it, he's coverage in case something happens i think he look i mean they if you're trying to think whether he has any trade value i mean they traded jay groom to get him like that's not i mean that's not a huge amount of value but i think you can just draw a parallel like think about what could you get for jay groom like that's basically what he's worth now it's because he's not being paid anything so i think they can always move him yes the no trade thing that he has can get in the way and but he's going to want to play you know i mean it, 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 find a place that really wants him and that has that bats for him. I think he'd rather be there than in Boston, right? Like he has no ties here. There, there's no, there's nothing keeping him here. If you say hey, you can, right. if you play here, you're our third string first baseman, or we're going to release you, or we can, we can send you to this team that really wants you and is going to play every day at first base. Like I, I just don't see that being a, a huge problem. So for right now, I think he's just a guy that's there as an option, right? Like if something falls apart, Cassis falls, cut fast. Cassis goes riding his bike with Chris Sale and falls off of it tomorrow. <laughs> you got a guy, right? Like there's no harm in him being there right now. But I do think as the as the offseason plays out, plays out, I, I don't think he'll ultimately be on the team come opening day. The Royals was a good one. I didn't think about that before. That's, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about that the other day, but. <laughs> Because they could use, they've got that young kid. I can't think of that kid's name, but they were playing at first, but he's more of a DH. So you could bring Hosmer in there and again, a team like the Royals, you know, here's a World Series hero of yours that you can play at first base for the next three years and pay him nothing. <laughs> it's not the worst. It's not the worst gig in the world. No, definitely not. And you mentioned Jose Abreu that you think someone, he's somebody who fits this Red Sox system very well and makes a lot of sense for this team. Is there anyone that kind of brings a red flag that you think the Red Sox probably shouldn't even look at? If there's any maybe interest in someone, you would make you go, no, 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 like this should not, he should not be on this team. He does not fit the system. Well, the, the, it's funny. The, the one that I think of is Jesse Winker out in Seattle, right? Like, I don't know if you've read all the things that like Ryan Divish, well, he's an awesome writer out in Seattle. He like went on a podcast or a radio show or something and just like openly was like, oh, everyone hates this guy. And, oh, my God. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Like you should look up like just everything that Divish said on the air. It was bananas that he that he just like doesn't work hard. He doesn't. But it's last year he was pretty bad. But the previous five years, he was like the fifth best hitter in baseball against right handed right. pitching. Like, I mean, up like better than Otani, better than judge. Like he was amazing. So, and he's making like 8 million or something. So Seattle, I mean, they just got Teoscar. They have like, they're, they're setting the outfield. They would surely, clearly they would like to trade this guy. Right. He, you could see him making, I mean, he makes sense, right? Like you could plug him in left field, play Verdugo and right. You've got 
ref Snyder on the bench as your like platoon option for those two guys. Mm -hmm. it, it fits. Um, but those sort of in the clubhouse red flags, I don't know if that's a, a direction they should go. Um, but yeah, he's the one that's funny that you asked that. Cause I just was looking at stuff on, on him today. Um, yeah, he, he could be an interesting fit. Um, a great chance to buy low from a team that seems sort of desperate to move him. But do you really want to bring that into the clubhouse? I don't know. We also just saw the Mariners trade uh, Kyle Lewis as well due to their, you know, outfield overload, right. as you mentioned. And, uh, you know, if, if there was anybody in your mind, whether it's trade market, free agent market that, you know, I, you think is perfect fit for the Red Sox to fill any of their holes, uh, who would that be? There's this one guy, he plays shortstop. His name is Xander Bogarts, and I think he fits them very, very well, and I believe that the Red Sox should sign him. <laughs> I've heard good things about him. Good clubhouse yeah, no, guy. <laughs> I, re I really do. I, I I just think it would be – a. I, this is how we – I think we started talking about this, but I just think it would be a shame for everyone if he doesn't go somewhere. Xander is this – I don't think Xander would like being like the mercenary guy signed to go, you know – help a team get to the next level i think he likes it here and you know he i don't know i just think the fit is is too good for that to not happen um so i think it would be a real shame if that if those two sides just can't come to agreement i i do think that i think xander's the best fit for any number of reasons and then once he's in place then you know more like what do you need to do in the corner outfield right like do you, does that need to be a bigger bat you know i i don't know i just think that's the that's the key. You're, you're pitching. You already know kind of what you have to do there. You need to, you need a lot of pieces to make it come together um, to make it more reliable. But I think figuring out what to do with the offense starts there. And, and if you can get Sander, then I think a lot of things can start to roll. So a lot of this just kind of rides on Xander. <laughs> like I feel like yeah, a lot much. of like what, what direction the Red Sox are going will depend on what happens with Sander Bogarts. Right. I think we can, I think you can at least imagine like the Red Sox are always sort of vague and they always kind of are wide net. And you know, there's a lot of things they're considering, but you can at least picture kind of what it might look like if they bring Xander mm -hmm. back. If Xander's not back, it just becomes chaos to me. Yeah. It trying to look in front here. Cause I don't know. I don't know who fills the shortstop spot. And if you have somebody who's a lesser shortstop, I mean, you know, could, do they get Correa then? Probably not. Right. I don't know, but it, it just, it just, it just feels like then, it's just scattered and I have, I, I, it's harder for me to understand to have a good sense of kind of which direction they could go. I think it starts with Xander for me. Yeah, we did an episode on the second base option. It was, it was just weird, you know, even considering the thought that it could happen. And, you know, Lauren even said it like, you know, we're not saying that this is going to happen. We're just, you know, we're, we're just imagining yeah, what, right. what could right. happen, it, you know? It, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to start to picture it. It really is. It's hard to start to go, okay, if he's out, you kind of have to rethink everything. Um, so we'll see. Well, one last thing for you that I was, I was curious about. I put out a tweet today that I've been hearing a lot of different answers on. And, you know, you, you've traveled to a lot of different stadiums, you know, covering you know, the Red Sox, the Yankees, you know, throughout your career. What is your favorite stadium to visit? Um, Outside of Fenway. <laughs> yeah. Well, Fenway was always one of my favorites. Um, when I was coming in as a visiting writer, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I mean, Camden Yards when it's when the Orioles are good is awesome. That, that that's a that's a really neat spot. I mean, Seattle's great. I love going to Toronto. I don't necessarily love that ballpark, but I love just being in that city. <laughs> so so that maybe colors my opinion. Mini Minnesota. I haven't been in Minnesota in a couple of years, but it's great. Um, like Chicago's ballpark is not or not Chicago. Cleveland's ballpark's not great, but the Rock and Hall of Fame is there, and I really like going there, so that's a fun trip. Um, but yeah, I don't know, just ballpark. It, it might be Target Field, um, but I think it's I think it's probably Camden Yards when, when they're good. When that place is like exciting and people are into it, I, I just think that's an awesome atmosphere. So I got like 80, 90 responses, and like majority of them were Camden Yards. Then we had some, you know, PNC Park, um, Petco Petco Park. Mm -hmm. um, also, also, you know. Wrigley and, and you know, some, yeah, some Wrigley, the experience of Wrigley is neat. Um, yeah, I've always wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's neat. It's neat to see it for sure. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Chad. You know, it was, it was really interesting to hear, you know, 
all your thoughts about you know, <laughs> puzzle pieces that the Red Sox could fill in throughout this offseason. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, but, you know, really appreciate you taking the time. And, you know, if, if anybody wants to, you know, check out your articles, you know, follow you on Twitter. Where, where can they find all that stuff? Uh, oh, it's Twitter. Are we still tweeting? We're still. That's, <laughs> For now. <laughs> For now. Um, Chad Jennings 22 um, on Twitter. Um, and that's kind of it. I don't really do a lot of the other social media stuff. The athletic loves that about me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, uh, but yeah, that, and then just on the athletic, that's where I am. We hope you enjoyed our episode with the athletics, Chad Jennings. We just want to thank Chad once again for being gracious with his time and taking us through what's kind of been the off season and what his expectations are. Thank you as always for making locked on Red Sox your first listen of every single day. Please rate review and subscribe to locked on Red Sox right here on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast is where you can find us. Also be sure to check us out on Twitter at LO underscore Red Sox, Jake at Jake Iggy, and then me, La 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 Lauren. And don't forget to check out the other shows across the Locked On Network, Locked On Phillies, Locked On Astros, Locked On Yankees, a lot going on, even Locked On Giants, a lot going on in the offseason over on those fronts. Be sure to check back tomorrow. We have Locked On MLB prospects, Lindsey Crosby joining the show. We're so excited. So we'll talk some potential trade packages and what it would take for the Red Sox to get certain players via trade do not miss that it's a great episode we absolutely love having Lindsay on and now that you've made locked on red sox your first listen head on over to locked on sports today to make it listen number two from the games that matter most you go behind the scenes beyond the scoreboard with local experts that give you insight that only locked on can provide it's free and available on youtube with the odyssey app wherever you get your podcast we'll see you tomorrow have a wonderful Thanksgiving Eve. Have fun, be safe, get home safe, and enjoy Thursday with your family. Until next time, let's go Red Sox.